Let's talk about uh, Attilan Rough Riders. Uh, Ooh, you know, spicy. Living up to the hype or hot or not. Charge the Ion Accelerator. It's time to forge the narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host, BL Bell All Souls Podcast. I'm joined by Adam Camilleri. Hello, everybody. And Tanya Gates will be joining us later. We're rocking and rolling a little bit earlier, a little bit ahead of schedule today. It's it's a wild time recording this every week. I'm amazed that we get it done when we do. <laughs> So, you know, it all just comes out on time, hopefully, most of the time. Yeah, they don't get to experience the joy and grandeur of trying to make this many-parted beast uh, move every week. Sticking the landing. Yeah. It's important. I want to talk about Lord Solar Leontis and basically how he's going to be in every single astronaut militarium list as soon as that model is available. Uh, dude, I'm... I mean, he's not in my. I'm, I'm playing a game with God um, in a couple of days. Actually, on a stream, funnily enough, you might be able to check it out when it comes out. It'll be all risky rollers. But um, yeah, I don't have him in it because I don't have the model. But as soon as the model comes out, I'm going to be having to discover the reason not to take this guy. Like, he's pretty amazing. Yeah, and I know we talked about him on like our review show, uh, but maybe it's worth kind of going over, you know, what his abilities are. And and he's very he's point efficient for for everything he does. I mean, he has 170 points, which is about I don't know three or four times what more points than every other infantry, you know, or mortal guard unit that you might take. But I think he's worth every single one of those points, maybe even more. I mean, like we've seen this a couple of times in ninth edition. Now the super, well, I guess the term would be pushed the super pushed keystone new characters. Um, all these these characters that have got a new, you know, brand new lease on life. Um, Hellbrecht is another great example. New, brand new model for the for a, a existing unit, but such a glow up from from what he was before. Trajan was another great example of that uh, for Custodes. Um, Lord Solar represents like possibly the best data sheet an Imperial Guardsman has ever had. It is insane how good this guy is and what how much it does. 170 points in the terms of Imperial Guard. Is a lot though. It is. I mean, and look, there are alternatives. You don't necessarily, you know, have to take this character. We, you know, we're we're saying that a little bit tongue in cheek, but it really good can give out, can do like all kind of orders all over the place, and yep. is got re rolls, which are kind of hard to come by in the guard mm-hmm. list. So the the only thing that will keep him on the shelf, or you know, you'll paint the model and he'll just be a beautiful centerpiece to bring out every now and then, is the I believe there's quite a decent amount of competition in the the guard HQ slot, and there's a lot of different buffs you can go after. There's a lot of different pieces of synergy that you can add. I mean, Ursula Creed. Um, I'm a big fan the, of her. You, big big oh, fan isn't, of her. Isn't exactly right. She, she cops in at 80 points, so you know, um, you know. 90 points less than solar does a lot of for your army as well has her own specific plus one to strength to your guns when she issues them orders in addition gives you some re-rolls as well so she's like the budget version um but you know you can just have both <laughs> you know it's still not going to break the back but what what's crazy is when you add up the fact that you kind of always want to take a command squad now this is because uh, guard has one of the best relics in the game right now in the finial which has to go on um a standard bear which has to be in a command squad so it's replacing a regimental standard now when you add up the 80 points for ursula the 170 for leontis and i think it's the 75 ish for a command squad for a guard army spending you know tantamount to almost to to over 300 points on something that's not a tank you're spending rogaldorn points on something that's not a rogaldorn exactly well or or rogaldorn ilk you're spending it on just just synergy we're not used to this we're not used to spending so many points on our synergy we're used to our synergy pieces being a single you know two or three single company commanders and a couple of platoon commanders you know capping in you know somewhere around 150 200 bucks giving a, a points giving us all the buffs and you know orders we'd ever need spending almost double that um to get a vast increased amount of synergies but a much more of our army taken away that's going to be i think the balancing factor for a lot of the, the good guard armies out there trying to find the the line i mean you talk about this all the time about on the thursday show and other ones finding the line between optimum amount of synergy but without taking away too many moving pieces points getting pieces from the functionality of the list do you know like the lineage of the title here the lord commander solar 
as in like the the primogenitor being you know Lord Macarius, Lord Solo Macarius, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it's like that's a title, you know, and it's, it, apparently it can you know it could be it could be other Lord Solars out there. So I guess if you were concerned about having one regiment or another, you could you know again as we were talking about yeah. kind of converting that miniature, or kit bashing that miniature into something else. I think you got some freedom Yarrick. there to do that. Yarrick on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Yarrick on a mechanical horse. Yes. Uh, but like the Lord Solar thing was pr- is pretty funny because it's like we need a title for a, for a bad who's like a galaxy dominant dominating bad and then we looked at the looked at the list of possible names and they're like Warmaster. Okay, we can't can't use that one. Uh, <laughs> you can actually that is a title like still this. in use. Yes, it is, but it's still it's like it's like oh we don't we don't want to. Uh so we, and plus I think Warmaster is like has to be an has to be a a enhanced human to get that a regular old you know tom and jerry's over here lord solar is the best they're gonna get not to get us too deep in the lore well but i i, I don't think there that's was, true i think that there, no, have there been was some human war masters he may have been a perpetual though which i kind of think is a bit you know a bit okay. more of an like human okay. as well okay Pretty, pretty, uh, you know, if Lord Solar does get shot in the eyeball and comes back in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll know, you know, the, the mold has shifted. But you are right that that pigeonhole does go deep. It, it really does. Look, again, that's not, we're talking about the stats and how he's going to be in a bunch of army list. But, you know, just, you know, kind of unpack it. And if people are, because, you know, still there's, there's a little bit of perception out there about folks that are kind of hesitant to use named characters in their army list. And, mm. Well, you know. let me just unpack this guy's data sheet for a moment. For 170 points, movement 12, weapon skill with skill 2+, plus, strength 6, toughness 4, 8 wounds, Six attacks, leadership ten, and a three plus save. If you saw that with in just by itself, not in an army book, you'd be like, "That's a space marine chapter master with a jump pack." Legit, uh, you would, you would, you would look at that data wounds. sheet. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I think Helbrecht. I think it'd be a Primaris something with a jump pack, right? You'd be like, "That's oh, a Primaris on a bike, uh, chapter yeah. master on a bike, or a chaplain on a bike, or something." Um, for that data sheet, but no, that's just a regular man on a not even fully mechanized horse. <laughs> Mech-ish. Hilarious, yeah. I, I adore this data sheet. He he packs a um, two shot pistol, which is essentially you know baby melter gun or baby baby plasma gun. Essentially, um, strength eight minus three three damage. No overcharge option, but you always get the three damage, which is nice. Twelve inches, two shots, and then he's got conquest, which is his super sword, which is essentially strength user minus three two damage. So he's going to have six attacks at strength six minus three two damage. This guy is like a blade guard sergeant with plus one strength on the charge it is uh not insignificant the amount of punch he has in combat like he can be everywhere you know you can scoot him to where you need to be for orders uh yeah. and then you know worse comes to worse you know he, he can get a little little fighty yeah i mean he's a great little um support piece i i kind of envisioned myself doing weird tactical stuff with him like someone gets too close use the dawn use the dawn to try and charge in and base a bunch of models solar goes in just tags into one of them so he takes the minimum amount of attacks back if he flubs and uh yeah you seem to just try and wipe the unit out well i have to attack into my toughness nine two plus arm to save you know battle tank stuff like that is going to be really cool little niche plays for guard players out there yeah with uh, the six attacks and then going in it, it damage to neck three with the conquest is the name of his sword there's a bunch he kills yes it does he does really well into a lot of things he also has a four up involved base and he's half damage rounding up so hitting with you know six damage something going to take three off uh, which is quite nice um he's also got that cool trick where it gets to swap out a secondary objective after you've seen your opponents okay like now what's the play in there? there is they're cotton see I'm of the opinion that a lot of the time in ninth edition with the current secondaries that we have, two out of three is pretty much ubiquitously locked in when you build your list. You build your list to do two or three of these, you know, be that um, bridge on the ground or the orders giving ones for um, Astro Militari and themselves or things like, you know, uh, banners and R&D, psychic secondaries, etc. What I do love is um, looking at people, someone's, things like that and just seeing if they've taken objectives that require them to kill you um and then if you were going to take something like behind enemy lines swap it out for something like um banners something like r d which you can just do a one-off action gain your points don't have to exist in a certain place don't have to maintain hold on things switching from banners to rnd i think is the most important one when you see somebody's selection of objectives requires them to apply pressure on you and then you take you, you, get, you take away their reward for that pressure by you know you you flip from banners to rnd so even if they do come and scoop your objectives they're no longer taking points away from your secondary game 
that you still get those points. Um, that's the best one for me. Or it's things like switching from, you know, one kill secondary to another, things like, you know, bring it down to R&D, you know, prisoners, et cetera, et cetera. Always seems pretty good. But, but when there's do few you armies switch, that give though, it multiple. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I know when you switch, but like, what is it that you're, you've seen in your opponent's choice or or whatever they've done that makes it where you want to switch after that reveal? So uh, let's say I was playing against Harlequins with the guard army and see Harlequins could play a very stable game I, I as a guard player don't hit them very well with you know minus one to hit across the board and things like minus one to wound that actually takes quite a lot of the percentages away from Admech sorry sorry um, from guard that's the other time so if they were just to sit on the other side of the board and play a pinch hitting trading game you know if they've got good terrain they could pretty reliably try and play for a pretty you know small to medium win depending on what I've chosen and how I choose to play so that is a play that, that Harlequins have and they always kind of have that in their back pocket but they're also have the threat of just like send in everything send in the clowns all in me and just see if i can dig myself out and so i can look at their secondaries and be like okay they've taken banners they've taken a stable psychic secondary which just doesn't require them to be 24 inches of my units they just have to get within 12 of the middle uh, so six of the middle they've you know taken ritual they've taken banners and they've taken you know maybe one of the the clown show ones that they've got that just relies on a little bit of pinch hitting pieces here and there i think there's one that just relies on you know one unit being my side of the table etc etc every turn stuff like that and if they were to do that selection i would be like well r and d is not as good now because they're going to stay back and zone out the backfields from me i can switch now into banners because it doesn't look like they're going to push it doesn't look like their section their selection of secondaries entices them to throw all 2000 points of their army down my throat and they're just going to stand back you know rely on laughing god dice and four up involves and minus one to hit to make it very hard for me to kill them and that's always the play for Harley. That's why Harley is one of the best generic armies in the game right now. They can play really well into everything. Uh, so I can look at that selection and be like, well, R&D isn't good anymore. Their backfield's going to be screened out with boats and troop units all game, switching R&D back over to banners. I'm going to try and hold these two banners all game by use of having double offset orders and things of that ilk from prefectors, from which Sol- Solar, Mr. Solar himself brings to the table. And yeah, just try and hunker down and see if we can play a similar game and punish them for not pushing on me. I like that, Wilson. Said. And Tanya's here. Hey, Tanya. Hey, how's it going? Like, yes, Adam, you just explained that perfectly. But, you know, if you're looking across the table and you're happy with your secondaries, you don't have to change and you get a bonus command point at this, uh, during your 100%. first command phase. Does, there's no no reason to change. I mean, if you pick perfectly first time, it's, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. And also, if you are somebody who is not that confident with your secondary picks, I think Lord Solo rewards you quite a lot because it gives you that extra little bit of knowledge um, in making your decision. So if you're not confident about a third pick, this is something I see a lot of people struggle with. I struggle with it as well. When I'm playing against a very well-constructed tournament army that doesn't give up any secondaries, like there's no way to get a good kill secondary against them. They've, they've got a very stable game plan. And I don't know what to pick for the third one. I can just wait to see theirs. <laughs> wait it's to see theirs. Some kind of placeholder. One. Okay, psychics, yeah. uh, you know, interrogation. Yeah. You don't have any psychers. Well, still picked it, you know. <laughs> Still picked it, you know, because I'm always going to change it. I, want, I just wanted to see yours, see yours first. Um, <laughs> so I think that's a that's a good, just a good thing for players who aren't as confident in that part of the game. Yeah, that's good. And I think I think that's still a, an issue. It's, I shouldn't say an issue, but one that it, it's like justifiable to be shaky on because it, it's something that changes every time. And if you yeah. if you don't have three good secondaries out of the Nephilim pack, then you're always probably trying to struggle to find that third. And maybe you just like the option of something appearing to you. More information. Mm -hmm. We talk about kind of the quest for perfect information and how to get it. This gets you one step closer, I guess. Yeah. I was funnily, I was joking with some player, with some friends about just shoving this guy in other lists because this, the, his, um, that part of his data sheet doesn't have any restrictions about it being an Astra Militarum army or detachment or anything. You can just ham fist this guy into a knight's army and mess around with his secondaries if you wanted to. It is quite funny. You'll break a bunch of, you know, your mono detachment, mono faction bonuses, but it is funny to think. And one of the armies I was thinking of is Custodes. Custodes actually have a really hard time picking three secondaries at the moment because unfortunately their secondaries aren't all that powerful. Adding something like Lord Solar in there where you just get to see your opponents and do a little backflip on one of them probably is better for them than guard because guard actually have a really good selection of secondaries at the moment uh we're, we're discussing if you kind of come in midstream here old lord solar leontis and why he's going to be in a lot of lists and how you kind of have to mm-hmm. if you're not taking him 
maybe having to decide why you're not taking them. Uh, that's certainly my opinion. Uh, Tanya, have you figured out a good conversion for him? I know we were, I, I can't remember if we were discussing it in the green room before the uh, one of the last episodes or not, or we were discussing it on stream. But yeah, I know you and I are both considering converting this guy up because I'm not enamored. I don't hate, I don't dislike the model. I'm not enamored with it. It doesn't fit my aesthetic. Yeah, it doesn't really fit the aesthetic of my army either. So I have two main options in front of me right now. One is to... Um, convert it from a uh, what is it the Cerberus Raider is that like the, yep, the Mechanicus yep. Horsey um, or my other option is to try and make something work with maybe like a Custodes jet bike or something like that oh, I no, just yeah. I, I need something more like mechanized just because all of my guardsmen have uh, Skitari heads so I want something that kind of fit that aesthetic nice yeah, yeah. because I'm going to be bringing him <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am not one who is comfortable picking secondaries, so that sort of rule alone is incentive enough for me to take him. Love it. Yeah. Uh, and um, let's talk about his commanding authority, and not just on the stat wise or in your army list or whatever, but on the tabletop with being able to issue all kind of orders. In your command phase, you can issue up to three orders. In addition to the normal units uh, that can be selected for regimental and perfectus orders, this model can issue regimental and perfectus orders to friendly infantry officer and military militarum auxiliary units. In addition to the normal units that can be selected for mechanized orders, this model can issue mechanized orders to friendly vehicle officers and super heavy units. That's huge. It's it's kind of nuts that he's the catch-all. He uh, can order from any tree to anything. I'm of the opinion, and this is a, I, I'm a hardcore guard player, but in the realms of 9th edition, orders are OP. Orders are straight up overpowered. Not, not you because think it's like I free believe, stratagems? Is it? Uh, well, it's free litanies, essentially. The, the comparison that we have for orders, even though orders have been around forever, forever. If you were to just put them in a vacuum and compare this to like the space marine codex so a space marine player has to take a chaplain who gets to pick a limited number from one tree and then they're stuck with those all game and then have to roll a dice to get them off to make them make them active um orders you get to pick any you get the you get access to the entire tree at your fingertips or in solar's case every one of the trees at his fingertips i think all 18 of them um you can issue at any time drop of a hat to almost anything as long as it's the corresponding mechanized to mechanized etc uh and you don't need to roll a dice they just kind of happen don't they yeah they do there is no they just, they roll just, to see yeah. it is just just happens and look that is how orders have always been they've always been just pick a thing yell at them that they, they go and do it uh, which you, I'm a i huge... mean you would have to sometimes roll leadership or something you know yeah yeah but uh, you know, they, they've kind of they are the keystone mechanic of the guide and have been as long as i can remember but to have such a variety of them and no offense they're they're very strong I, the only one that got weaker i believe is move 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 which is fair enough you should not have access to a bajillion double moving units at, at all times in the current game it has been something that's stripped away wholesale from other armies so giving them to guard now would be pretty crazy but i want to point out the Prefectus Orders. So the Prefectus Orders are only available to, I believe, Lord Solar um, via, I can't remember if it's a relic or a ruler trait, or uh, to a Commissar. So these are the orders that a Commissar brings. No, he just gets and them. These, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Oh, Lord you Sol mean as an alternative method, is it a relic or whatever? Yeah. It, okay. Lord Solar just gets him. Commissars just get him. And I think you have to use a relic or a ruler trait. Can't remember which to give it to somebody else. I think yeah. you can add him onto another commander. But these things are nuts. They are super powered at all costs. Is the, is the power that I think is the game changer. Until the start of your next command phase, this unit gains objective secured. If this unit already has this ability, until the end of your next command phase, models in this unit count as one additional model when determining control of an objective. Essentially what that means is that as long as I have 10 guardsmen on an objective, you cannot, as long as, as, long as I literally have 10 guardsmen, there is not much you can do to run on it and take it off me as long as you don't turn off OBSEC. There's really not many ways to get 20 guard, 20 models onto a unit that already has, t onto an objective that already has 10 guardsmen on it. Yeah, that's what you'd have to do. You have to get 21 on there when I have 10 on there. So physically, it's just really hard to fit that, first and foremost. If you kill them you, and you kill you know, well, five of them, I, it's still I, I, 10. Admittedly, I mean, I'm, st I'm stating exclusively if there's 10 alive on it. Yeah. But even if there's four and you run five intercessors, well, those four guys are eight guys, like, and you didn't do anything. And it's in the command phase before I score my primary points. I get to flip it back and undo your work. 
And for me, I think finding um, and getting the most out of the prefect disorders is going to be another big skill check for guard players, another place where you can show your flair and how well you can you can maneuver these things. The other one, and this one I actually think might be a big problem, uh, remain vigilant. This one is a little busted. Uh, until the start of your next command phase, enemy units that are set up on the battlefield as reinforcements cannot be set up within 12 of this unit. And the rest of it is, you know, overwatches on fires and hold steady, et cetera, et cetera. But that one, turning any model, any unit in your army, as long as you're able to issue them the order in the command phase, into an infiltrator. I play a lot. I pay a lot of points for that privilege on my infiltrators, mate. I know, yeah, I know you do as well in your Blood Angels. We pay a lot of. We pay a hefty premium for that single special. Role. It does feel like me, it. I can just sling this out. I can just sling this out on no point. You know, nobody's just hanging out in the front line. You know, not even with a special weapon. <laughs> you know, if I don't want to. Okay. Um, and this you could be mentioned. Get back in the fight. Yeah. I mean, until the next command yeah. phase, unit is eligible to shoot or charge, but not both in a turn mm-hmm. in which it fell back. It's 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 really really good this tree, um, but yeah, like I said, it's much harder to get this into your army, especially if you don't choose to not take uh, Lord Solar. Okay, I have a question. Sorry to go back about remain vigilant. When you issue commands, though, you can issue the same command to units. Is it within six inches? Yes, you bubble you bubble them out within six inches. Correct. Okay, so then if you have one unit that you can't deep strike within 12, and then they bump that out to units all around them within six inches, like that's a pretty big null zone. It's huge. I mean, potentially. Mm-hmm. Well, even just 10 dudes, even just 10 infantry at max coherency, you know, with you tying off the edges, the ends of the coherency bubble is, is a lot. It is a lot. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, I do need to point out one thing. I do not believe that the um, commissar orders, I, I'm looking at the commissar commanding authority. This model knows the prefect disorders. So this is the commissar data sheet. In your command phase, it can issue one order. In addition to the normal units, it can be selected for prefectus orders. This model can issue prefectus orders to friendly infantry officers and abhuman units, but when doing so, regimental tactics don't, ability does not apply. That's the ability that that bubbles it out. So if you order abhumans or other officers, you don't get the bubble. So you can only bubble when you you order core units. Oh, Lord Solar does not have that. Rule. Yeah, Lord Solar don't give no. He is the catch-all. Literally does whatever he wants. Oh, sorry. There's a rule. Pfft, I'm Lord Solar. Never heard of it. it that um, whole like doesn't bubble out. Does not. He does not have that uh, yeah. qualifier. But you, you're, you're exactly right, Tanya. You can you can just get into the middle of the table, double move a bunch of guys into position. You know, behind terrain. Turn one, um, and then turn. Well, not double move. I mean, you know, move, 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 extra move them, and then turn to just slap this order down until they don't have anything in reserve anymore. It's it's really quite cute, and it's going to mean that playing behind enemy lines versus guard, uh, playing R and D versus guard, is is just, just going to be extremely difficult because at any point they can just decide you don't get to do it. But at the same time, let me just say, sniping units versus guard is going to be back in vogue. I truly oh, you mean to think take out commanders and stuff. This, this, so a, a commissar, yeah, toughness three, four, four wounds with a what? Is he got a five up involved with a five up involved save? Like you can kill that dude very easily. Targeted smites. Um, one one unit that I've I've heard a lot of Eldari players or you know Syriani players getting started and get excited about again is shroud runners. Hundred percent commissar hates. That you've got shroud runners. Oh, they've um, been making their way into a bunch of lists recently. The shroud runners really have, mate. Really have. And if guard hits the hits the meta in a big way, I wouldn't be surprised to see you know a single unit of eliminators starting to come back in a big way. You know, being more acceptable to be in more lists. And just one little, you know, something just to keep them honest. Oh, you've got a four wound nothing character that's giving out really pivotal buffs that are hurting me. Well, I'm going to take 100 points worth of something just to to nullify that one guy. I, I like I like him a lot. I, I love all these little characters coming back. Also, the new commissar model um, has that come out yet? The one he's he's standing pretty has basically, but he he just looks like a bad. Yeah, I agree. Uh, even the Cadian Castellan looks really good. Like, yeah, all these, I, I'm really all these models look amazing. Really digging. I don't think I'll, I'll be getting the new. I'll be getting the new. Um, Creed model, the new Ursula Creed model, but I'm probably going to use my custom Creed model, which is the one I've been using forever, which is the the um, Cadian Enviro Hazard c- Command Squad. I'm oh, just look, a big fan of that dude. I know it may sound like we talked about Lord uh, Solar a lot, but we're not actually done. As a... <laughs> Oh, there's more. <laughs> He's got more. Well, remember we talked about you know with the with the orders and whatever. He can also issue those orders to the uh, military auxilera, the perfectus orders, and so that does cover a lot of the abhuman stuff like the ogren as well. Yeah, um, I'm willing to bet there are some play with the with those orders when stacked up on ogren and 100%. being able to um, you know, yeah push them out. So 
I mean, I know Tanya yourself, you have lamented many times. You look at your mega knobs, you look at your Bulgrin, you look back at your mega knobs, and you're like, these should be comparable. And the <laughs> mega knobs just like double fist dunk, break the backboard offensively compared to the Bulgrin. Um, but there is one order I want to bring to everybody's attention that really activates uh, the old Bulgrin because they, they do essentially still just have what auto cannons in combat, strength 7, minus 1, 2 damage. But now fixed bayonets exist. Until the end of the next flight phase, this is just a regular order, it's just in the regimental orders, so any commander comes with this. Don't need to be a commissar or lord solar. Um, until the end of the next flight phase, each time a model in this unit makes a melee attack, add 1 to the attack's hit roll and improve the AP by 1. So your Bulgrin are now um, hitting on 2s, at strength 7, minus 2, 2 damage, which is enough to let them break through a lot of armor contempt units and actually contend and rumble with some of the, the chunkier, more defensible units out there. I don't mind this. I don't mind it either. Oh, that's a rundown it, it, of, of uh, basically Lord Autotake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to leave him at home. Uh-uh. No, I, mean, I just need to know how big his base is, pretty much, before I start. That's why I'm waiting for the model to come out before I start trying to put a proxy together. I just I, He has to be on the right size base, of course. And I want mine to be the same verticality. Like, I want the same silhouette, essentially. I always like, if I'm going to make my own model, I want it to fit as close to the actual. Oh, yeah, I think that's mandatory. If you're ever doing that, mm. the base size has to be the exact same. Or uh, Base size, for sure. It's it's more the height. I want the height the same. Um because I feel like that's the bit, if I, if I didn't, that's the bit I would complain about or I'd be sus on myself. Uh, well, the photographers have uh, done a really good job of disguising the bases in the pictures here. Uh, I, dude, I was thinking, I was literally just looking at the model being like, this gives me nothing. <laughs> well, I, I think it's got to be on the, the 60 mil. Like, it's got to be a Dreadnought base. It's got to be, right? It's, it's huge. It's a big horse. It is, but I'm thinking it's it's a round one, not an oval shape. I think it has to be the 60 mil. I mean, look, we're guessing. We're completely guessing right now. But, mm. but when but you we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, the new guardsmen are on 28, and it looks like it's three guardsmen across, so yeah, 60 mil. I mean, everything, sh- all things should be scaled against the number of guardsmen across, right? <laughs> it's a new unit. <laughs> Americans will I mean, use anything they can to anything. avoid the metric system. <laughs> How many square foot is your house? All right, give me an hour. <laughs> <laughs> at least 250 least. guardsmen. It's a battalion, a full battalion. Um, uh, I'm glad Red isn't here because I'm about to, sp- to praise G-Dub for something that would Red would get me in trouble for. But I'm so happy the Crusade rules are at the end of the Codex. <laughs> Not that I have anything against Crusade, but it's just another bunch of pages between me and what I want to do most of the time um and kudos to you crusade players soldier on i hope you're enjoying the hell out of the game um and how you like to play it i know that this the crusade is very deep and is very rewarding it's just not how i play the game and i hate having to go through all those pages and then back through all those pages and through them again to like find find a points cost find a data sheet find a this find a that i, I just want to say like as somebody who does actually enjoy crusade i actually want it at the back as well because i don't want to start trying to come up with like crusade rosters without knowing what the heck the units do first you know Mm -hmm. it just sort of makes sense that you're going to want to read through all your units and sort of get an idea of what you want to do before you jump in and start looking at all those extra juicy like crusade relics and stuff that you can get Uh, i i have hope for gw yet (laughs) well they finally like split the streams you know don't cross the streams you know (laughs) thought was taught to us enshrined in my soul by ghostbusters and crusade and match play don't cross the streams. Let them have. Let them exist in their own sides of the data sheets. Yeah, so be careful, folks. People are all hyped off that grand narrative, which was amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's not to love? All right, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back, uh, talk more Astro Military Arms stuff. See you in a minute. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games, Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Everybody, we are back. Let's talk about uh, Tillin Rough Riders. Uh, Ooh, you know, spicy. Living up to the hype or hot or not? What's uh, going on? Uh, hot, 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 hot. <laughs> Don't. I, I, I'm, wait, I'm waiting to see the models in real life before I decide if I'm going to proxy my own. I'm pretty sure I want to proxy my own. I want to do. I want to do what are the, 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 the Attilan, Attilan Jackals, Italian Jackals. Yeah, from um, GSC with Cadians on the back um, instead. That's that's what I want to do. With my Rough Riders at, but that data sheet is once again quite pushed. Uh, if I was to describe, once again, if I was to describe this data sheet to you with it out of context, you'd assume this was almost a space marine. Um, movement 12, weapon skill 3, plus skill 4, strength and toughness 4, 2 wounds, 
two attacks, leadership six and a four plus save. Until I got to leadership six and a four plus save, that was a primary space marine, um, almost, except for the ballistic four plus. But, you know, whatever. Uh, we get where you're going. They're, they're good. They're, they're good. Um, they have very legitimate melee. These guys, I think, can, are quite comparable to uh, Repentia, in my mind, as in they're a very good glass cl- cannon pla- uh, you know, melee platform that can be buffed to the bejesus. Once again, they can take the same uh, order fixed bayonets that I just mentioned putting on uh, Bulgren, so they can be hitting that on twos with an extra rend on their hunting lances, which, uh, which are strength user, minus one, one damage, but take make two attacks instead of one, so they're four attacks each, or the, the one you're always going to use, which is strength plus two, so going to strength six, minus four, three damage. That's the one you're always going to use in the current game at the moment. But where it gets real spicy is their two special rules on their data sheet. They have hunt horse masters. They ignore all modifiers to move, advance, and charge rolls, so they always just charge on their dice, advance on their dice, and scything momentum. In the fight phase, this unit is able to make a charge move at this turn. Uh, sorry, if this unit... It made a charge with this turn till the end of the phase add two to the strength characteristic of the model so you're telling me yeah this regular dude on an essentially regular he's horse he's got a pointy stick the charge man. hits as hard as a thunder hammer strength eight minus four three damage that's an assault doctrine thunder hammer in combat and it's not minus one to hit you're telling me it's better than a thunder hammer because it'll actually hit on threes twos if it's fixed bayonets wowie this is like this is some juice. But you don't think the fact that they're kind of paper thin, easy to wound. Yeah. Well, that's that's the comparison. Like, this is why I think a lot of people who are th- saying they're going to take 30 of these guys, sure, take 30. And when they're good, they're really good. I'm of the opinion if I was to take 30, uh, about 10 of them would get used and the other 20 would get picked off because someone got an angle with some freaking bolters. And yeah, with, them. with your big bases. So. <laughs> I mean, these are all yeah, larger bases. It, it, is a, it is a factor. Yeah, I could only really see myself running minimum size units of them mm-hmm. because normally... Normally, like, I mean, I haven't played much, but from what it looks like, five should be enough to remove most things. Um, And, like, you're not going to be able to hide ten of them behind cover or anything like that, I don't think. And like you said, they are paper thin. hmm. There's always the thing with with playing guard. The things you can hide is at a premium. You always want to be able to hide, like, a tank commander, now probably a dawn. Um, It used to be, you know, you'd have to hide two tank commanders, um, two manticores, payload manticores as well. So there's four good sized chassis that you had to hide. And then it was literally as many infantry as you could hide on top of that. It fit around that stuff. Um, if you want to take those out, I still believe people are going to have, you know, probably a tank commander, if not uh, a tank commander, or a couple of Russes in a Dawn. So there's, there's already four big chassis to hide. And then you want to say you want to hide 30, you know, cavalry bases as well. I'm sorry. It's just not that feasible to, to, to think you're going to do it. I'm probably going to be starting with two units of five. I like two units of five. It fits. I believe I can hide them, keep them safe because I don't plan to try and pressure my opponent with them. I plan to use them to make them think that if they get aggressive on me, I'm going to give them a bloody nose. That kind of, that kind of a mentality. I do Um, like a lot of uh, having that counter assault, even if it's like kind of medium power counter assault in the army, just a little bit. What are you talking about? Medium, baby. Well, guys, number of the m- number of models number of attacks you know kind of thing it's like yeah. it's just yeah. it's a deterrent but but not a showstopper exactly well the, yeah, exactly right they're not going to take out other people's death stars you're not going to go in with five of these guys like you could with five death company and threaten somebody's termi bomb you know in csm but what they can do is anytime someone puts a little little a little you know thing out there to think they're going to run in and start tapping some of your tanks and tying some things up you can just be like oof those five assault marines uh, uh, ain't gonna ain't gonna cut it now mate you're going to need like at least two more of those to think one of them is going to make it because my Rough Riders are going to eat them to bits. Um, you're not like deluding yourself too many points wise in your shooty stuff, which, which I also Yeah, exactly. It's not robbing, it's not robbing from Peter to pay Paul as well. So five guys of these will go in with what, two attacks each with three on the side. So 11 attacks. It's not a huge dump of attacks. I do believe if you're doing this, you want to be able to give them fixed bayonets. So to hit it, make them hit on twos. And so you'll get, you're going to have plenty of officers eight. that can do that too. It's like just... Ex- exactly right. You're going to, you're going to get eight hits, give or take, which probably translates hit winning on twos to, to seven wounds at rent four. 
So Space Marine is going to take a six up because it's going to be turned down to rent three. And so, yeah, look, you are very much odds on to kill five Marines. Very much on with, with fixed bayonets to kill five Marines. If they're transhuman, it gets a bit icky, but um, then they're spending a bunch of CP to stop you. It's only five guys for five guys. It's, it's pretty fine. And I think if I remember right, they're only like a couple points more than a Primaris Marine. I think they're 22, if I remember correctly, although there might be 20 points each. Uh, we can check. I, remember, I thought they were 20, but, you know, still too. right in that range. Uh, where are we at? Plus attack, Talon Rough Riders, 20 points. Mate, oh, dude, you tell me I can get a primary space marine with a jump pack that has a thunder hammer for 20 points. Oof, please, can I? <laughs> so question about that. So if you're worried about transhuman physiology or anything like that, I mean, couldn't you... Like, how do you feel about bringing the Kurov's Achilla relic now? Because it, like, basically once per game, you can make one stratagem cost one extra. <gasps> I love it. I love it. It's it's so in the Nephilim packet when you know CP are at a bit of a premium, and I got to tell you, if the orders are really good and cranked and powerful in this book, the stratagems are the fuel. Like it, it's very rare in Ninth Edition that we've seen an army that I believe lives and dies off its CP use. How many you have to start the game? How many you spend? You know, on relics. I mean, I, in my Dark Angels list, I've been starting the game with zero CP because I don't believe I believe front loading and buying more buffs of my army at the beginning is better than anything I can spend during the game. But here, I think it's the other way around. I think you want to be a little frugal on how many spend pre-game. I think only a single battalion is is the hotness for guard. And you're absolutely right. Kuro's Aquila is, is a phenomenal relic. I'll just read it out for you guys, um, for those of you who may be unaware. Once per battle, after your opponent uses a stratagem, excluding a command reroll, the bearer can use this relic. If it does so until the end of the battle, the command point cost of your opponent, so your opponent must pay to use that stratagem, is increased by one. So transhuman costs one more etc etc that and i think it's the finial um let me just read the finial out you mentioned you that well. earlier yeah it's i What's did because i think i think the finial is the auto auto take for me and then if you want you take cross acrylic as well if you think it's going to be a good meta pick exactly to, to tanya's point um so the finial of the Nemrodesh first command squad model only with a regimental standard has the following ability while a friendly a friendly astro military core unit is within six of this model model's unit each time a model in that unit makes a ranged attack you can ignore any or all modifiers to the attack's hit roll and if the attack is allocated to an enemy model that enemy model cannot use any rules to ignore the wounds it loses um a la wound gating models and if you don't know this term wound gating it means a model that can only take a certain amount of wounds per phase so it allows you to one-shot Gazgul. It allows you to one-shot a Baden, one-shot a Catan. This, I believe, is the auto-take. And then I believe Tanya's onto it with the, with the Kuroz Aquila being the next kind of super spicy do-you-take-it relic. How do you feel about the Grand Strategist Warlord trait? Because that one's looking pretty good to me. I know. It actually is looking really good to me as well. So that's the that's your, um, you get him back on a 5+, plus, right? CP. Right, yeah. Because I was reading through the stratagems, I was like, ah, oh, there's so many good ones, but you're going to mm. be so strapped for command points. And then I read Grand Strategist, and I was like, mm, yeah, so maybe we'll just take that. While this ward is on the battlefield, each time you spend a command point to use a stratagem, roll 1d6 and a 5 plus, it is refunded. So if you spend a 2 CP command point, you get to roll 2 dice to see if you get 1 5 to a refund. And with the amount of command points I think you're going to be spending, like I'm, I, I, look at, I look at the stratagems, I'm like, I'm probably spending 2 to 3 a turn in my, in my shooting phase to just to supercharge and get the most out of it. And then in that case, like I'm rolling, you know, 3 dice for a 5 every turn. That's usually going to result in me getting a CP back. So it's spending 1 CP for grand strategist to hopefully get four more than the one i spent because i'm going to get one back every turn on top of so i mean it's it's hard to turn down also in addition um, i know i'm talking a lot uh lord solar comes with grand strategist so if lord solar is in your army i believe he has to be your warlord is that correct i think so chain of command if your army includes uh, lord solar that model must be your warlord if more than oh, one model go. from your army has the rule to this effect one of them must be your warlord doesn't mean you have to buy him his, his uh, warlord trait though you know in nephilim you don't have to you can have him without purchasing his warlord trait and buy warlord traits elsewhere if you'd please i'd probably buy his warlord trait i don't know it's just looking good to me it's fair you know i'm digging this uh platoon command uh, changing gears just a little bit is i think one of the things that a lot of us old-time generals 
for the Astro Militarum we're going to have to get used to is the fact that, you know, we might have some mixed regiments and different aesthetics on the table than maybe we're used to. Like, we've already made mention of kibashing or converting some of these models yeah. that do not have the look of our particular regiment to look like a regiment. And that's okay. How do you guys feel? So I've got a bunch. I, I mean, I'm all Cadians. My whole army is Cadians. Uh, but I have a bunch of flamers. Now, I can't take a flamer on an infantry squad unless it's a Katachan infantry squad. Is everybody kosher? I mean, I don't even know yes. the question. Is. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if I am yet. Are you kosher with me just taking flamers in my squads and saying they're kind of chance? Yes. Even though they're obviously yeah. Canadians. Yeah. You kosher? Yeah, Good. I Good. am. Yeah. It's, it's people are going to have to get their heads around that. I mean, where where does the line get drawn? I mean, I, I don't know if there is. I don't even know if there is a line. I just know that you know. Hey, I like the look of the catagen. And so my non-catagen units are still going to be catagen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm fine with it. I want to have flamers. I like flamers. Bernie, Bernie, go good. And also my flamers are the guys who have the the sweet cigar in the side of their teeth. I want to use those models. Yeah, and I, I mean I do like the idea of like the the look of like this Cadian officer, and you know I think the special characters are cool, but I'm probably going to have to catagen them up a little bit. Fair too. So, but I think it's something going to be something we all struggle with, especially if you've been playing this uh, regiment. You know, a lot of it's like Space Marine chapters. People do identify and and throw loyalty in and with certain regiments. And I'm not saying anybody has to get over it, uh, but I'm saying that we should be accommodating to people that want to do, you know, I guess convincing kit bashes or whatever mm. for their army because uh, they're trying to look for a certain certain feel. Yeah. I will point out one more thing about the, on the command point front. If you don't want to take Grand Strategist or you want to double down and try and get even more command points into your army, have a look at an astropath. They are 40 points to take in your army, and they're an upgrade atta attache to your command squads. They can perform the following psychic action in addition to being a psyker with one psychic power from um, whatever the psychic power is called for the, the card tree. Um, in your psychic phase, what astropath model from your army can attempt to perform the psychic action? If completed, you gain one command point. It is a warp charge seven. So it is not guaranteed to always go off. You're paying 40 points for the privilege, but if it generates you, you know, two to three CP a game, it's probably worth it. Well, um, in addition, it's like Canada oh, discipline is what what you're. Uh, what yeah, you get access I could to. remember the name of it. Yeah. I was going to say tell it, tell a, tell a cease is discipline, but I think that's the Inqu Inquisition one. Well, don't you get it from an interrogation? Like you can have a secondary. Yes, you can, but you got to roll above the the unit's leadership. So sometimes you know you're playing against Necrons, that's a ten, that's a tenner, and it's not always going to happen. Um, but you know, you're playing against Orcs, I think it's a seven or an eight. Hey, that's quite likely so it's pretty much the same deal but if in a game where you you want to you uh, so you take an astropath for 40 points unlocks the ability to take psychic secondaries in addition that if you don't want to take a psychic secondary just sits in the back of the freaking board outside an eye range and just sees if it can give you three cp across the game probably value you town if you've got the 40 points to swing i do like the idea of having psychers in the army yeah i think so i think i think unless it, until um, it's but the only thing you're giving up now is a ball the witch and I think a ball the witch is only good against about two armies that are really strong in the meta at the moment. That being some, not even all, Tyranid armies. The Tyranid armies that choose to go heavy, you know, double zoanthropes, double neurothropes, you know, Turvagon, Hive Tyrant, stuff like that. And of course, T-Suns. And the fact is, T-Suns are taking out almost a quarter of their army to add in non abor giving models such as Flamers. So it's not even as good into them anymore. Yeah, I... <laughs> Abhor, we've seen kind of fall out of a fashion, I guess, because units are, our armies are really good at denying you points. So with, especially yeah. with things like the Thousand Suns, it's like you, you may struggle to get into them until later in the game where it may limit your point scoring potential. Agreed. So, I mean, it's psychic away. Just, just go for it. I mean, especially if there's something in this tree that you like. Mental Shackles is looking good to me. Keep people off you. I subtract two from the move characteristic of the models in the unit that you target and subtract root from the advance and charge rolls. That's good. Uh, so there we go. Yeah, uh, that's basically the, what I want to talk about this episode. Love it, mate. Can't wait to get these new kits in my hands. Please, G-Dub, let me know when they're coming out. We don't know when. I'm, that's the thing. It's I like... know. It's, oh, I can't make plans. Which is, which I suppose is good because I'm committed to playing uh, Dark Angels for a little bit longer. But you know, I, I want to paint a dawn. I want it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that really it's probably the best thing to do is to hold off on allowing this book into tournaments until it comes out in wide release. So that's a good discussion point. So you're of the opinion that you you shouldn't allow until it's you know it's on the shelf for everyone to buy. I, I feel that way. Yes. And I, I think it's been consistent with how I felt in the past too, uh, because it's. 
with the way they put these box sets out, you know, it's committing you to buy a, a big chunk of stuff that maybe you don't necessarily want, or you don't you don't care about the limited codex print or the cards or the models that are in there. So I feel well, like it may create I, even more FOMO, you know, kind of thing. I, I, yeah, I totally agree, mate. And um, for I, I pretty much come from the perspective that in Australia, places like Australia and New Zealand, who sometimes at times get less of the the product, and when we do get, of course, it is more expensive down here. To have it be on a brand new codex, such as Votan, sure. If if you it, when no, when nobody has it and you have it and you run out and buy it first and you can only play with the stuff that's in the book, sorry, that, that's in the that's box. It also is like you. Can couldn't really have the book without also having the models yeah, exactly totally fine when it's an existing range that's getting a new book in a in a box you don't want to have like little little timmy who's you know just got his 2000 points together he doesn't have the money to go out and buy what's in australia you know 250 300 plus dollar box set um and you don't want him to not be able to play his models because he can't afford the box you know but at the same time you want to you want to get people you want to keep people hyped and excited for the new stuff it's an interesting discussion i think it's only started happening well in this edition of the game we had the orcs codex come out in a similar fashion i think we had the black templars one as well and now we've had the a guard code has come out in a the, similar the fashion. orcs was the biggest thing and i think that was well i should say the biggest that's where we had the discussion about that and i think that was consistent with what we what we're we've had here is that wait till it's in wide release better off great you got the book early it's awesome but not everybody has it you might even create a situation to where one player is playing with the old rules and you're playing with the new rules and yeah. that creates a, a an awkward situation for any potential opponents throughout the weekend exactly right so just you know pump the brakes but in this skin we don't we don't know when this is coming out and that's the that's yeah. the hardest part well <laughs> and to any TOs out there, I think the the safest thing to do is just ask your players. If all the guard players who are coming say they've got the new book, maybe it's not as big an issue. And if they all want to play with the new book as well as having the new book, maybe it's not as big an issue. But as soon as you'd have one that would be like, ooh, I'm not sure I could come if we had to play the new book, then you've got to really think about what's best for your community. That's a good point, especially if you're running like a, like an eight-person tournament or whatever, and you know all the players that are coming and you have direct access to them, then you yeah. could just vote in whatever you want. I was more talking about more of general things. Yeah, spot on. Like I'm one of the big super majors, like if the LVO was happening this weekend, you know, uh, they, they'd have to make a pretty spicy call. It'd be tough because, you know, I'd, I'd certainly want to cobble together a, a Lord Solo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Uh, what's the base size? <laughs> yeah. But I, I, yeah, I, just, I just think that that's probably the best way to go about doing it. Because typically there's only a few weeks in between these things anyway. You, we're, we're talking about one event. I'm not saying that might not be someone's only event that they go to, or it's not important or whatever. I'm just saying that in the grand scheme of things, waiting a little bit is for that type of match play is probably not a problem. Yeah, totally agree. Um, what's next up for you guys uh, event-wise? You got any games coming up, Tanya? You got any AOS on the horizon? Well, I ran my first Age of Sigmar kind of event last weekend, which went really well, and people are already asking me to run another one oh. in January. So that was really fun. Other than that, the next thing that I have is I'm just going to be helping out with the stream team at LVO. Fantastic. Can't wait. Yeah, super excited. Um, but yeah, no real events other than that for me. It's just it's just a long way for me to go. I live in the middle of nowhere, so I'm either flying or driving five plus hours to get mm. places. Well, so. You were just don't play on tabletop too. It was a it was a bit of a a hatchet job with uh <laughs> with the uh, <laughs> the space marines specifically designed at killing Xenos, and you're playing Xenos. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I brought a pretty uh, uh, interesting list as well. I, I'm kidding, of um, course. It was, of course, you know, an awesome cool. People should go watch it for sure. <laughs> yeah, it was super fun playing one of the people that, um, like, one of my favorite people to play against. Uh, I was super rusty, but we just had a, a really good time, and... Uh, I'll get you next time, Space Marine Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I'm planning a little adventure post LVO up to Vancouver to visit with the lovely play on table with Dob Gents. I'll challenge him. I'll challenge him to a, a Space Marine throwdown, and we'll see who walks away <laughs> the, the better of studies. Do There's it. The There's the gauntlet, by the way, Steve. The glove has been thrown. <laughs> uh, I love it. You have to like come and avenge my honor. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare think I'm, I'm, I'm good enough to avenge your honor, but I'll do it for all of us out there. Love it. Uh, I'll be at uh, Pax Unplugged this weekend. 
Ooh, exciting. Ooh, nice. What are you doing there? Going to be doing the demos for stuff for games workshop nice oh nice i said yeah you in official capacity not just there as a as a fan yeah yeah i'm going to be there at the booth most of the time so if anybody's in the area come say what's up nice are you, are you, are you going to be are you going to be teaching kill team again uh probably kill team maybe some war cry maybe some blood bowl you know stuff like that fantastic cool. yeah. well, they're they're great games I, I love war cry war cry was the one where that was the first of the skirmish games where they had like the the extended capacity of wounds like this guy's got 24 wounds Sounds crazy, uh, but the bottle looked great and the plays really well, so you didn't care. Brilliant. <laughs> and then Blood anytime Bowl. that I anytime that I hear that like one tiny little model has like a bazillion wounds, I don't know why, but my head just automatically goes to Monty Python with the Black Knight. <laughs> <laughs> As it should. Yeah. I think the first time I experienced that was, was it in Lord of the Rings? When you had, I think it was the Fellowship of the Ring and you had like Aragorn who was just like, stab me more. I don't care. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> um, it was pretty, always a, always a borrow me. I, th- I remember one of them, you could just take an amazing amount of hits. Also, I went to Hobbiton two weeks, you know, two weeks ago, I think now. Oh, we mentioned that briefly on the last episode. You got to tell us about like, what was it like? You, you went yeah. on like a tour, right? You had. Oh, you, you can only go there on a tour. They won't let you walk around, unfortunately. I, me and my partner considered breaking in, like sneaking in the middle of the night, and <laughs> just sleeping in the surrounds, and then just, you know, probably waking up and getting arrested. It would have been worth it, you know. Um, but it is phenomenal. They have like spared no expense. They have leaned all the way into making it immersive, and it it feels like Hobbiton. Do you remember going to a theme park when you were a kid mm-hmm. and just being like that level of excitement about the place and feeling immersed? It's just it 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 gave me all of that as an adult, and it's probably the first time I've really experienced that in many a year. Like, uh, I mean, I get the same thing as an adult, but it's 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 that as an adult, like going to Adepticon, being at LVO. I, so I'm assuming being uh, going to Warhammer World one day when I make that mecca pil- uh, pilgrimage will feel similar. But this one gave me that childlike joy of like this is just so beautifully done and the attention to detail was phenomenal like every one of the hobbit holes had like a bit of character around like there was the the one smoking the fish there was the artist the one that made honey there was the one that you know did all, yeah it was it was amazing the attention they had little like they had chimneys going there was smoke coming out of things I, it was it was wonderful it was truly a beautiful experience anybody who's at all a fan of the lord of the rings which is probably like 99 percent of the people, a big overlap yeah. 100 percent. yeah it was massive uh go just go check it out new zealand is a phenomenal place as well to spend i spent a week in the north north island um and i hear the south island is even more beautiful the north island is gorgeous like i climbed volcanoes did a bunch of cultural experiences checked out all the thermal ca- all the thermal pools and all that awesome stuff learned a phenomenal about about the maori um the you know the indigenous culture absolutely phenomenal and hobbiton was the best bit for me like uh having having lunch at the green dragon inn um which was just so Ooh, beautiful what did you have I had like a, they had like a, you know, it's, it's, it's token. It's like English food. It's token food. They had like a roast, a beautiful roast lunch for us. Um, yeah. A, a bit of roast beef, a bit of pork, uh, some, you know, some taters. Got to have the taters. It was really nice. <laughs> what kind of taters though? Boiled? Mashed? Uh, mashed. Yeah. yeah you put them in a stew. Well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was really good. I so I never I rarely take photos of myself. Very rarely. And I have a, my beautiful partner was there with me. Thank you, Natasha, putting up with me because you know. But hey, I take photos of you all the time. It was my turn. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I did the whole going. You know, you know, Bilbo's at the start of the Hobbit. He's like going on an adventure. He's running down that little path. Well, that little path is the, the entrance into Hobbiton, where they have all the Hobbit holes, and you pretty much walk in that path, and then just go, "Whoa, this place looks exactly like you thought it would." And I made her do like three takes of like multiple <laughs> photos of me doing the run, the stupid little run down the pathway, of going on an adventure, and then I look at the photos and be like, "No, do it again," <laughs> like like a prima donna, just like just. <laughs> Man, I don't blame you. That's your one shot. I got it yeah. exactly right. I don't know when I'm going to be back. Uh, exactly, I did it. Um, and now I can't wait to go back. And I'll be looking up the list of all like the 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 glaciers and mountains they you know t- took the shots on. And I'm just so keen to go and like do another cup. I'm just nerding out now. It's activated the whole <laughs> nerdness inside of me, and I'm on a, I'm on my own journey. This is pretty cool, though. I mean, I'm I'm happy that you've been so enthusiastic about it, even a week or so later, because it's a big testament to taking the trip over there. Have any of you guys got the audiobooks, the the full audiobooks? I was looking at them on Audible. They only have the the, the dramatic rendition ones, and they only go for like three hours each. I'm like, I want twenty hours, baby. I want word for word Tolkien's text written down. Dude, just put the Blu-rays in. You know, just 
Are well, no, mean- I want to be able to I want to be able to paint and go for jogs and things and and get and download the whole all the books into my brain directly. Uh, um, yeah. Wait, wait, wait! Don't they have a version that's read by Andy Circus? They do. I'm trying to find it. Like, I mean, I think I just have to look a little harder um, because I'm I'm betting it's out there. I just have to buy it off not not off Audible because that's, that's what I was looking. I was saying, yeah, I have to get it off Audible? Amazon. Yeah, make sure to leave us a five star review on Audible while you're there. <laughs> This is why you get the big bucks. Look at that segue. Mwah. <laughs> Just kiss. <laughs> a consummate professional. <laughs> I like Adam and I. Um, no, this this tangent, nerd tangent is right up our alley. No, man, I, we have the passion. We have the, yeah, we, we have all facets covered, unfortunately. Narrative. Oh, my God. <laughs> Speaking of uh, next year, if you come to Warhammer Fest, uh, we will have to jaunt up to Warhammer World. Oh, yeah, ma- in Manchester. No, yeah. Manchester's yeah, a little bit outside of London. Yeah, it, it's just next to adjacent London, adjacent. I call it. It's like two hours away. I think <laughs> it's pretty far. Yeah, but the trains all like the trains are designed to get you places. Well, yeah, they've got a great a great train system. I hear. I mean, I don't know if uh, I think they. So there is a perspective of people in the UK loving to complain about things. Um, but I've been on I've been on the public transport in most of Europe, and it's all been pretty respectable. I haven't been to the UK yet, though. It is light years ahead of what it is in Atlanta. I mean, not just, just my yes. small in comparison is like, I don't know about other major cities like New York or whatever, but it is a million times better. And that's, that's underselling it. Uh, isn't, yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing how like culturally different yet the same some people could be like, if for a British person, sometimes two hours of travel is just like too much, right? Like, oh, we got to make sure we get a hotel and like spend the night and stuff. And meanwhile, in Canada, some people drive two hours just to like go to Costco. Yeah. yeah. That's not even, a, that's not even the other side of the city yeah. in Atlanta here. Yeah. It's a, I mean, because we're sitting in, you know, traffic, but still, you know, yeah. time is time. Just in Canada, the distances between everything is so vast that like two hours each way, that's a day trip. Nice. Well, look, we've uh, we've certainly run the gambit here with conversational topics, but a lot coming up. So we, we all actually will be all at the LVO and uh, yeah, and then, you know, where we're fast on the horizon, I'm looking forward to trying to get over there and do that. I think it's certainly going to be a big thing. Check it out if you haven't already. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll be having shows to the end of the year and then get planning out what we're doing next year. We'll all be fun talking about our uh, guard kit bashes over the next few weeks as well. <laughs> We're all guard players. Look, if you're just joining the show, uh, Red, who's not with us right now, is also a guard player. So, you know, very, very excited all, about this book. We all kind of have a different flavor. Like, Paul's the Katachan, I'm the Cadian. Actually, Tanya, what is your denomination of, of guard? What is your regiment? Um, well, I have, like, my custom head cannon. So, yep. um. I play them a variety of different ways, um, but it's built into my lore. They are mostly Cadians, but they have different, like they have a head swap. Cool. That's fine. Yep. Good enough. And yeah. you know, Red represents the Tanith first and only, because he's such a, he has such unique perspectives on things. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'm just Cadian through and through. I'm vanilla, baby. <laughs> and look, now you got all this extra grit. Now you're, uh, you got to stand strong for your planet that doesn't exist anymore. That's right. The several rocks, conglomerated <sighs> rocks. Of my domain. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be all right. <laughs> well, that's our show this week. Please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. Leave some five-star reviews and some comments. Those are like complete hassle-free ways that you can interact with the show. And it helps other people find us as well. So please continue to do it. And thank you for everyone that does it every week. Five-star reviews, Spotify, Audible, iHeartRadio, iTunes, all that stuff, wherever you can. Uh, please leave them. We really appreciate it. We'll see you all next week. See you then. Bye, everybody. Tenets demand you tune in next week for the greater good, of course.